So I wanted to talk today. So we did the first day where we talked about. Mm, it doesn't sound great either. So I'll do it from here. Um, we talked first day about wages, inequality, um, the big trends that are making our world so strange and so uncertain, um, and related them to changes in the in communication technology and automatization. And the second day, we went more really into the management area. We talked uh, yesterday about how firm organization is changing, how the jobs of managers are changing, how technology is changing, how th the things are inside the firm. Today, we're going to talk about the biggest issue, which is the long-term growth. I mean, in the long run, as one economist put it, productivity is not the main thing, it's the only thing. Okay? There is nothing, uh, there is no economic growth in societies like ours, which don't have really demographic growth anymore, without um, pro productivity growth. And the good news is that AI, I'm going to start with a couple of, of, of figures and ideas from Chad Syverson's current paper. It's an MBR paper uh, that came out today, so uh, it couldn't be fresher. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a working paper from October 2018. Um, and here's a beautiful figure. So humans have an ability to recognize uh, images, an error rate of 5%, and an ability to recognize words with an error rate of 5%. Over the last uh, months, both computer vision and speech recognition have gone beyond 5%. So today, we can say images can be recognized better by artificial intelligence than by humans. And you can imagine in how many fields that's going to matter. Um, from medical fields, there are at least three or four medical specialties where the main job is recognizing images, pathologists, um, x-ray radiologists, dermatologists who are looking at our molds in the back and decide if they are looking good or bad. Um, there are lots and lots of jobs where that's going to be a big deal. About, uh, if you think of speech recognition, there are millions of people employed in call centers, and you can imagine the potential productivity gains of replacing all of those people once you have a better speech recognition than humans. So productivity, the productivity news should be outstanding. Truthfully, it isn't at all. This is a long-term uh, growth, uh, smooth productivity growth projection from uh, the Bank of France. These are four economists at the Bank of France, uh, Bank de France, and it starts in 1891. So except for the Second World War, productivity in the United States, Euro area, United Kingdom, and Japan has never been as low in a hundred and something years. Look at the uh, big moments, what they called in French, like Les le, le 30 Glorious, los, the 30 Glorious Years, um, which are the years after the war. Here, yeah. um, productivity growth rates uh, in Japan, 8%. So. Same person, no, no demographic growth already is giving you 8% of, of output per hour. Uh, what's the, if you think of technology, what's the story? And I tell you because I think it's going to be important for what we want to discuss today. The story is that... Did you turn it on? Ah, that, that's a good idea. Turning on things is, is not bad. It's good technology. Speaking of technology. Yeah. Speaking of technology. Okay. Yes, technology works. You see, usage of technology is an important thing. That would be a, that would be a lesson of today for sure. So, um, what's the story? If you think of technology, what people, economic historians say, particularly Roger Gordon, who's looked at this data very much, say, okay, all these things happened here, particularly in this period, this period around here, and this is the famous year Einstein wrote all his papers. But around here, you have aircraft, cinema movies, uh, television, uh, all electricity is being developed, cars, um, cars are from, from this decade, everything that kind of changed the, the 20th century happened here. Productivity was low here, and that's going to be important to our story, because one thing is we have electricity, another thing is electricity can be used to change our lives. You need a lot of complementary innovations, you need to do things with the electricity. Um, and all of those things are being done around here, okay? 
all of those things, these innovations are really spreading around here. You can have electricity, but you need to have a house that is connected to an electric grid, and that needs a street that is connected to an electric grid. And once you have the house, then you have demand for certain things and so on. Now, what we have here, however, is really very much in contradiction to what I just told you. I just told you that we are in the cusp of potentially one of the largest technology, technological changes that we have ever seen um, when an ability that we have, which allows us to, uh, to be humans and to, to think, is going to be basically replaced, recognizing images, recognizing voices. Uh, there are all these, I don't know if you see those, uh, Boston Dynamics robots that come on the internet occasionally. And the robot now, yesterday, was doing break dancing pretty well. On four and two, dancing around, it was, it was really scary. Uh, so if you look at the US, same thing happens. You have this, this really huge productivity growth in all those years. You have a few low, a bit lower, uh, and then you really have below 1% growth uh, sustained over quite a, quite a long time. That's the first fact. I want to tell you three facts about productivity, and we go back to organizations. A second fact I wanted to tell you about is the gigantic productivity heterogeneity between firms, okay? So you pick two firms doing the same thing, doing concrete, as I'll show you one slide from Chad Cyberson, uh, doing uh, um, plane uh, maintenance. There has been many, many papers doing these things. And you see that there is a difference of multiple times. Uh, controlling for inputs, controlling for everything, maybe twice between one industry, one firm and another. And this has been done, as I was telling you, at the level of very, very detailed industry categories. Uh, <clears throat> this is one of these papers. Uh, the best one, uh, the best person on all of these things uh, in the world is Chad Cyberson. He's up here in the fifth floor uh, on productivity and on how uh, on, on firm heterogeneity in, in productivity. So he has this paper on concrete where you see the dispersion uh, of productivity being very, very large, and you also see that the dispersion is affected by competition. There is uh, all of these firms in a perfectly competitive market shouldn't exist, and when you increase competition, you do see that they exist less. It's not like they don't exist, but the tail moves in. There is less of these bad firms and more of the good firms in a high competition environment, which is what you would expect. Um, this is a paper for uh, Chang uh, Tai Shiek, who, who is also here uh, with Pete Klino, who was there at, at the time, who was here at the time, um, on a TFP of productivity differences in India and the US. And he shows that uh, they show that in India, there are a lot of bad firms that survive in the US. If you're really bad, you don't exist. OK, so you have a thick tail here. You have a tail there. So first fact, productivity is slowing down. Second fact, productivity heterogeneity. Let me show you productivity heterogeneity in a very, um, in a very specific way. These are photos of textile plants in India from Nick Bloom. And he starts, when he talks about management practices, he shows you this. This is actually working plants. These are not abandoned plants. So uh, people are just storing stuff. They don't know where the stuff is stored. They don't know where the manufacturing, where the products, where the inputs, etc., are. Um, so he's trying to claim, look, I mean, when we talk about productivity, it's, it's easy to think in a very vague way, but it actually means when you have somebody who's 64 times, 250 times less productive than, than, uh, than, than, those, than, the, than the top quartile firms, there is something that's really going uh, extremely badly. So that was my second fact. And here's my third fact that is going to be very important. And it's a fact that I, I, I mentioned the first day. Unlike what has happened in the past, these productivity differentials are growing over time. There is a very, very significant difference between the top 5% and the bottom 95% of the firms that is growing and growing. So um, what I'm going to try to argue, um, or, or what I think is happening, let me say that because I, I'm not going to have uh, proof of, of that and nobody does. What I think is happening is uh, there, there are several, let me just put first the hypothesis on the table. There are several hypotheses on the table for why technological change is so humongous, and we don't see anything happening in the productivity statistics. There are people who think that productivity is measured. Again, Chad in another paper has actually pretty reasonable 
evidence showing that, look, I mean, the numbers wouldn't add up. You would have to be mismeasuring in all sectors, even in sectors where these things are not happening. Um, other people think that uh, it's actually not such a big deal, that technology is not so important. Um, other people think it's about market concentration, that you're not really seeing the benefits of this technological change. Um, this paper that I was telling you by, by uh, a child and Eric Brynjolfsson from MIT from today says, look, what is really probably happening is something like what we saw before. Um, what is happening is that we're here in some sense. We are at the start of a huge revolution, and in order to profit from that revolution, there have to happen a lot of things that aren't yet happening. A lot of complementary innovations and a lot of changes that need to take advantage, we, we need to, to, to make in order to take advantage of that. What I'm going to add is the kinds of changes that we need to add now are not just hard changes. Like before, when you have electricity, you need a motor, and all companies can just get motors, and they stick them in, and they don't really need to know much about motors. Um, to use an example that you were using yesterday, Luigi. Uh, but right now, a lot of the changes have to do in how are you organizing your work, how are you organizing uh, the way the, the, the firm works, and how are you thinking, and what are you doing with, with your actual work time. And that kind of change is much, much harder to do. Okay? And I'm going to tell you about the psychological resistance to change and the incentive resistance to change, which would be something that would be important. But I'm going to tell you about why it's hard to change management and management practices. So basically, the idea is that information technology has big complementarities with certain management practices, and that firms that don't do management right, or things that don't change the way they're doing management, they are unlikely to adopt information technology. We see it for the US. Uh, Nick Bloom and John Van Rienen and others have a paper showing that uh, US do information technology better, and the reason they do information technology better is because they have the right management practices. Um, Peregrino and Luigi, have, uh, Luigi Gales, who's here, have a paper on Italy kind of arguing, uh, I think it's pretty persuasive for anybody who knows how Italy is, Spain is similar, uh, that uh, the, the family and kind of non-meritocratic structure of, of Italian firms makes it hard to adopt new technologies because the kind of the firm is like a group of friends, the family, etc. It's much harder to kind of import talent from abroad, from outside, and, and adopt these, these practices. Uh, another paper on Italy that actually finds uh, quite um, uh, strong complementarities. So the idea is you need two changes in order for technology, technological change to, to work. It's not just, oh, I have the same company and I put a computer, or I have the same company and I put an AI, and things are going to change. I actually need to make some complementary changes. These are complementary practices. So the first thing I wanted to do is to tell you a little bit about complementarities. This is one of the most important ideas in organizations. And to tell you why it, they make organizations so difficult and why it makes technology adoption so, so difficult, then show you an instance of technological adoption with complementarities and talk about barriers to innovation coming from there. So let me just step back one second and tell you about complementarities and why change is so hard. And it's from a beautiful book by John Roberts. Uh, yesterday I told you about a little book by Ken Arrow, which was just seven pages, 70 pages or so, The Limits of Organization. Today I tell you about a book by John Roberts, which is called The Modern Corporation, which is also very short and also very re readable, and I, I very much recommend you. Um, <clears throat> so what, what do we mean by complementarities? You guys know from your demand uh, classes, etc., about complementarities between um, uh, products that are complementary in demand, like coffee and sugar, and I think everybody has an intuitive understanding of what that can mean for firms. Practices that are complementary in firms are practices where if you do one more of one, you want to do more of the other. So if you are um, using high power incentives, uh, the three leg legged stool that Mike Gibbs will remember very well, if you if you uh, are using high power incentives, then you actually want to decentralize. Uh, give lo strong decision rights and measure what people are doing. If you're not going to give incentives, what's the point of doing a lot of measuring and what's the point of giving them decisions if they are not aligned with the organization? So those three things are going to go together. Same thing for technologies. Here we have two technologies. Um, as an example from John Roberts, a flexible manufacturing 
a narrow or broad scope of, of products. And basically, when you have low flexibility, you have low narrow scope. That goes together. Those two things go together. Okay, they are complementary. Um, that's the original Ford car, if you remember that you can have any car as long as the Model T and it's black. Okay, that's no narrow, extremely narrow product scope and no flexibility at all in manufacturing. I only know how to do one thing, okay, which is that car. Now, the point of complementarity is any of these moves doesn't make any sense. And that's a point that I'm going to make very much about technology. Being flexible if you have a narrow product scope is useless. And being broad if you don't have flexible manufacturing is also useless because you're not able to really change what you're doing. Uh, Toyota succeeded by being both. And John Roberts claims that um, GM spent more money than the combined value of all of the Japanese car producers at the time in introducing flexible manufacturing, but it didn't change the product scope. It had unions. It was very difficult to actually make uh, the complementary investments, and it was completely wasted. This is a good position. That's a good position. This is a bad position to occupy. So uh, here's another example. When we have like uh, a modern organization, a mechanical organization, people have low span of low, um, it's very centralized. They they have they can do few things. Uh, there is very strict rules. You're just doing one thing always, and there's a rule that says what you have to do. Uh, there is not a lot of communication in teams. When you change to an organization, each one of these practices makes sense with all the others. It would be silly to put a very smart, high worker skill requirements here. You would be wasting your time because people have very narrow scope and they're not going to be talking to each other. Vice versa, if you have this type of new modern manufacturing practices, if you have low skill requirements, you're in trouble because people who have broad job definitions and very flexible and work together are not going to be able to do that. So the idea is there are sets of things that go together. And uh, why is this important? And why does it make change difficult? Um, the thing that makes change different, difficult is that in a system with complementarities, there are multiple optimum. Look, here's one of your optimization functions from a micro class. Uh, the standard uh, to, uh, optimizations that we usually uh, do for all our lives, right? So if you think, okay, so I want to have the ideal weight, and you start eating too much, you know, and then mm, that's not ideal, I'm, I'm in trouble, I'm gaining weight, that's my, my happiness is going down. You start eating less and less and less, and then you start getting too thin. You, you optimize over this, and you find your ideal weight, okay? When you eat two times a day, not five, and we just stop eating ice cream, whatever, okay? So with a function like this, nobody sees that function, but with a function like this, you can find the optimum, okay? So a firm that is trying to decide the prices says, well, I'm going to raise prices, see what happens. Ah, oh, I sell less. That's not a good idea. Then they say, oh, I'm going to lower prices. Oh, I am actually making too few, too small margins. No good. So they say, oh, this is a good place. I'll stay here. That's an easy optimization. And look how, how, how easy it is to change as well. Now the world changes. We had this function before. Now we have this function. And are we going to have trouble adapting to change? No, because remember, we don't see this curve. But we say, oh, now it looks, looks like there is more, more profits on the right. I start doing higher prices or whatever it is that I'm optimizing. My profits go up. I adapt. I get to the new place. Now, with complementarities, all that I told you is not correct. Um, they're going to happen. Two things are going to happen. Well, obviously, we have indivisibilities, meaning we have... Uh, things that we have to adopt wholesale. So we have to make a big investment in AI. We have to adopt, uh, we have to hire a new department. We have to change uh, in terms of uh, spending some fixed costs. But mostly, there is going to be um, a, um, a relationship between the variables that is going to mean that you need coherent patterns between them. Uh, and what that means is that if I change a little bit, I have these lower skill requirements, and I say, oh, the world's changing. Let me hire a bit smarter people. Things are going to go wrong, because in the production that I had, smarter people don't help me. So I go back, and I forget about it. Then I say, oh, let me, I see other people are doing more flexible manufacturing. Oh, I'll do more flexible manufacturing. That's going to fail, because your people are not smart, your product range is not adapted, etc. So what it means is that you're going to have multiple optimal like that. Let me show you one example of these complementarities in a two by two. 
So here, there are two choices. And there is product A and product B. I can be in A or I can be in B. These are the two choices, the choice on one axis and the choice on the other axis. These are like mountains, right? This is a three-dimensional landscape. So if I walk down that landscape in this direction, I increase A. Look, I have higher profits here, okay? I would like to be there. But imagine that I try to find it by moving by my one. I try to move A here. I continue here. I'm going down the mountain. My profits are going down. If I stay here and I start increasing here, I also go down the mountain. My profits are going down. Both ways, I'm actually worse off. If I want to cross from this mountain to this mountain, two things have to happen. First, I have to move in the two directions at the same time. And second, I want to have to traverse a valley where things look very bad and where I'm not making lots of money. So when things change with non-concavities, it also means that I'm going to have potentially, it's not just smoothly moving to the next optimum, but potentially there's going to be something better that is really far out. Uh, I'm not just going to be walking towards the next optimum. Okay. So uh, the, the, the reason that change is very hard is because decentralization in an organization is not going to get you there. So everybody's trying to do the right thing. And they are all taking what everybody else is doing as given. So there is the marketing department, and they are doing marketing, and they say how finance is, and what's the budgeting problem, and what's information technology, etc. And they do their marketing. And then you have information technology doing things in a certain way, in accounting, etc. If you go in that organization, you say, oh, we have artificial intelligence, and you give it to the IT department, and it's wasted. Because nobody else is doing things that fit with that. And there is no value to that new technology. If somebody in marketing starts to think of new ways, well, there is not the data. Nobody's collecting the data. Nobody's processing it, etc. So the change with complementarities requires centralization and leadership. Um, uh, there, there is a sense, if you think about it, if you think of these two mountains, if you think of Moses, right, in the Bible, it's clearly like it's the promised land, right? We are in a place. Everything is coherent. Things fit with each other. Somebody says, no, 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 there is something better. We can change all the choices we're making. Somebody needs to see it. Somebody needs to see where that is. Somebody needs to communicate it and to encourage everybody we're going to move to this new promised land. That's the problem of change in a world with lots of complementarities, that you really need to get everybody on board. The leader needs to really say, guys, this is going to happen. We cannot stay in the old mountain. We are going to move, and we're going to go through the valley. It's going to be worse. But believe me, that's, that's good. That's going to happen. Okay? So that was just a little detour to put on the table what I think causes this performance heterogeneity and these difficulties in adapting technology, which is that information technology um, involves complementary changes. Uh, there's been a lot of literature in the past saying that um, this is one of the most famous papers in economics, in, in industrial organization. Uh, basically, these guys went through all the production uh, line of a valve producer and actually checked how they were producing and what were they doing. And they found that only when you adopt a whole set of changes, uh, human resource related and technological related, you actually benefit from the new technology. And that's what I want to show you with a concrete example that I actually uh, studied myself. So it's in the Journal of Labor Economics and it's about crime and policing. And it actually gets exactly to this point, as you will see. Well, we were, we were thinking, hey, you have all this new technology for police. Um, could this explain the massive drop in crime in the US? Uh, could the fact that people have information technology and laptops and computers and all that be responsible for the fact that you actually see lower, pri lower crime? And we had a very nice data. We had a survey of all the agencies in the US. We had that data during the period that IT was mostly more growing most. And we merged it with very good productivity data. You actually know all the crime, all the arrests, etc. You know how productive a police department is. Are they stopping crime? Are they arresting people or not? So you have the productivity measures, which are excellent. And of course, you have all the demographics, etc. This is for the entire, every single police department in the US is in our data. So just to show you that indeed computer use was growing during all our periods. And we basically grab the period. If you do this research up there, then you're not going to find anything because everybody has already a computer. It's nice to do the research when all this X, the, the variable that you're studying is actually switching, uh, shifting a lot. So uh, what we did is, uh, I will not go into the, into the 
uh, specifications, but basically, just to explain you, it's what is called a panel for for those of you who don't who don't who, who remember it from statistics. Basically, what you do is you look within each county. Within each county, you see how much crime changed and how much uh, information technology changed and how much organization changed in that particular county. Um, and you don't compare across in some sense. Okay, you do it within to avoid too much of the demographics and so on. Okay, so here is the interesting thing. That's a massive investment in every police department, in everywhere in the US, lead to an increase in productivity. More arrests, less crimes, more crimes solved, any of those things. Nothing. Nothing at all. Clear crime clearance rate goes down or is, or is in significance, so we're not solving more, more crimes. Offense rates are actually going up. More crimes. The departments that invested more in IT actually saw, what this suggests, higher increases, uh, larger increases in crime. After we, do, we did all the methodologies and we checked about everything and uh, we went through all the lags and leads and all the things that I won't bore you with that, we were left with this. IT adoption grew, but there was no good news, no productivity improvement. Um, <clears throat> so what was the solution? The first thing that occurred to us is, oh, I, I, I say first, but it took us a while to get there. Uh, recording crime. Computers actually are very good at recording crime. So maybe we're just measuring more crime. You call the department in 1987, you say, my bike got stolen. They're like, yeah, sure, boom. They hang up and put the report, throw it to the trash, and that's it. Now you file a report, it's in the computer, and there's one more crime. Of course, in both cases, it doesn't get solved, but before, no one knew that the bike got stolen. So one possibility was recorded. The other possibility, is uh, maybe just giving a policeman a computer is not going to increase crime if you don't do things in a different way, which is what I was getting at with the productivity increase. You really need organizational change together with the IT adoption. So both things are going to work. The first one worked very well. We actually had in this data, very luckily, and I don't think it happens in any data set, we have a variable that said is computer used for record keeping. So we actually put that together with the ITUs, and we saw that little crimes, small crimes, actually increased, and that they are actually increasing when you are record keeping. So homicide, rape, etc., is not changing when you use a computer like that because people were already recording homicides and rapes, but bikes stolen, that is now being recorded and not before. So it was part of the story, but the puzzle remained for severe crimes. And we were lucky that we were watching The Wire, uh, do you guys know what The Wire is? Best TV series ever, and everybody who, who likes management and organization and economics should watch it. Basically, you have a very dysfunctional, uh, corrupt, and messy police department, and a really functioning, well-functioning, and very well-structured uh, crime gang uh, with good incentives, everybody else that they have to do, etc. I'm exaggerating, but it's two organizations, public sector and private sector, a crime and other, and a beautiful, a beautiful, beautiful story of what's going on. So, during the 90s, the big crime story was the drop of crime in New York. Uh, this guy, Bill Bratton, who afterwards came, was the master of this. And he introduced something that was called ComStat. And if you see TV series, even if you don't see The Wire, you've seen. Which is, hey, I'm not just going to give you a computer, but I'm going to do something new. Basically, the key innovation was geocoding the crimes. The crimes get geocoded. We have a meeting every morning at 8 o'clock in the morning. All the prison captains are there, and we go over why is there a cluster on 42nd and Woodland? Why is there a cluster of crimes? Have you put people there? Are you checking what's going on in that corner? Are you actually uh, proactively deploying people, etc.? And you are the captain, and you're going to have to be explained, or the sergeant, or whatever it is. You're going to have to be explained, yes, we are after that. We know there's a gang house. We are looking. Okay, so um, you put the goals, you make people accountable, you geocode, you, you geocode the crimes, you organize geographically the district, so you give the captain the ability to move people from one unit to the other. You don't say, oh, I am just a homicide guy, I won't do anything. No, you let people move them around. You empower them, you, make, you give them the data to do that. So we thought maybe giving a computer to these guys doesn't make any difference. Maybe you need to give a computer and change how you organize. So we were lucky that, oh, this is the ComStat meeting. Okay, that's the morning, 
that the, the crimes are geocoded. If you see, and every morning all the captains are meeting there and seeing, look, this happened in your district. These are your statistics. You guys are behind. If you don't solve this in two months, you're out. Okay, so so that kind of 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 uh, of, of accountability. So we actually had something that was like that. We had the, the information technology, the problem solving. We had the feedback, the geographic deployment, and changes in the in the skill requirements. So we built our own Comstat viable. And um, what happens is all of these things didn't really work. But uh, in all regressions with controls and everything, what you see is that both clearance rates, uh, clearance rates actually increase. So you're solving more crimes, and offending rates actually drop. Uh, although those that's less less significant. So. Our take on this was, um, and I go back to complementarities into the productivity change. Our take on this was, um, in most of those innovations, um, technology, AI, communications, etc., is not really about the technology, but it's about how it changes the way work works. And you can think of classroom technology, right? All the research we have from Israel and from California with really good experiments is that you give the kids a laptop or a phone, and you know what happens? The uh, school attainment goes down. Big surprise, right? I mean, I ask my kids, what are you guys doing with the laptop at home? Everybody's an expert at alt uh, tap, right? They're all there with their watching internet, reading, uh, watching Facebook videos, chatting with their dads, because my kid only chats with me when he's in class. I say, like, oh, can I call you? No, no, I'm in class. Oh, OK. Uh, <laughs> he's been chatting to me for 15 minutes. Uh, so uh, that's not very useful. When is computer use and computer technology going to be useful? Well, maybe you're going to have new technology that's going to allow you to flip the classroom. Maybe the kids, maybe the kids are going to have to answer with a flipper when there's a question, and you're going to see who's not attentive. You're going to have to change behaviors. You're going to have to maybe empower the teacher. You're going to do lots of things. And I think it happens here in the police department, and it happens in every organization. The technology, information technology, information is what the organization is about, and. If you process information the same way you used to have it, to process it, the technology is not going to make a big difference. So um, in many, many other areas, uh, you see this, this complementarity. And I think it explains, together with the idea I told you why complementarity is so hard, it explains why adoption is very difficult. You need an organization that is committed, that is going to rip everything down and start again and change. And you know how everybody in their own corner of the organization is going to be reluctant to do it. And I had a last point I wanted to tell you about why productivity adoption might, might, be, might be troublesome, which is about size and scale. Um, the first day, we talked about how communication technology is making firms larger and it's uh, allowing for concentration to increase in many markets. But also, the scale is crucial. Uh, and that suggests that that's probably the, the, the source of the economy of scale for IT adoption. Um, already, since people have started looking at this, uh, have, they have noticed that the returns are larger for larger firms and that complementarities between organization and, and, and technology really appear mostly or only for large firms. So it's really very much about large firms. Um, and I wanted to show you how this could actually work between countries as well as within countries. So this is European data. It shows that there's a lot of heterogeneity in adoption of, of, of technology in Europe. Uh, the countries that are mostly, uh, that adopt less technology tend to be the ones that have more micro businesses. Look at the size distribution, uh, size distribution in, in Europe. Um, if you look at the share of firms by size, a place like Italy or like Spain, look at Italy, 90% of the firms have between one and nine workers. Compared to, if you look at the US, uh, uh, Seventy-two percent of the firms. If you do it by by workers, the difference is is as large. It's very very large. So, um, the the dominance of this micro business um, is probably uh, explains a lot of why these countries are actually much less able to adopt technology. And why do micro businesses dominate? There are many reasons. Okay, but one is regulatory. This is a paper in the uh, last last year uh, that I wrote with John Van Rien. Uh, and clearly large, well, we actually showed that in France, there's many firms below 50, and there's few firms after 50. 
And what happens is that there is a ton of regulations that start at 50. This is the distribution of firms in the US, and this is the distribution of firms in France. You see, there are more small firms, and the break happens here. Here, distribution is the same. Post 50, there are less firms that are large in France. Uh, why? So if you look at the kinds of things that a firm over 50 has to do, they have to do everything from establishing a profit sharing to introducing a union, a, a health committee, create a firm council and dedicate 0.3% of all the payroll to pay for the firm council. If you're an entrepreneur in, Italy, in France, in Spain, Italy have similar regulations. In the US, you have it for um, Obamacare. It's also 50 workers. So if you're a firm that is at 49 and you're thinking, I don't know, this Christmas is going to be good. Should I hire three guys? You're probably going to say, well, let me not have all these headaches here. Okay. You're, I hire three guys, and then I need to put a union person, spend 303, well, you know, forget it. I mean, if you know you're going to become 500, then these things are not going to stop you. But if you're thinking of being a little bit larger, then they will. And that's what you see here. Uh, firms around here exist, but, but, but these firms prefer to stay here than to jump to this size. Um, in, in Spain, there's many regulations like this. This is a... 50 worker also exists in Spain. Uh, taxes, companies have to pay. This is 6 million euros. And to see how things persist in, in history matters, this is 1 million pesetas, which is 1 billion pesetas, which is from the pre-euro. So this, when the euro came in, this threshold stayed because at this threshold, you go from being taxed by your little local tax inspector to being controlled by the central tax inspection of, of, of the government. So they have a special inspection for fir big firms. You get into this at this stage. So you are much, much more likely to not want the headache and stay below that size. So does this account for some of these things? Uh, probably. Um, the firms that are uh, uh, between one and nine workers are not likely to have a PC. Uh, half of them have a PC, are very unlikely to have selling online, are very unlikely to, to, to give IT to their workers. So the idea is, first, you need those complementary investments. You need to be decentralized. You need to have a lot of ways to use all this technology that are only going to come if you make all these changes together. Second, you need to have a certain size for these investments to make sense. Those two things together probably explain a lot of the differential. So let me wrap up um, and, and have a little bit of time for, for you guys to, to discuss or to have a, a conversation about some of these things. So <clears throat> the first thing is, um, I've, I've told you three things about productivity that I, I hope are, are clear in your minds. One is productivity is slowing down dramatically. And this is one of the strangest things for economists and for anybody who thinks about it. Uh, we feel the world is changing. We feel we have the data in our hands. We feel... Uh, everything is going to be different tomorrow than today because of artificial intelligence. One possibility is that this change is fake. Okay, so Gordon, who is the economist from Northwestern I was telling you about before, has been arguing that these changes that we saw in the 40s um, are so much larger than anything we can see now. So he says, look, uh, these, what we see today, you know, 200 characters on Twitter, uh, spending time on Facebook and wasting time, that's really not a big deal. Uh, what we were seeing here is the death of distance really with planes. People in the 20s didn't go by plane. People in the 50s went by plane around the world. Cars didn't have cars. Kitchens, electricity. He makes this point. Look, if your great, great, great grandmother from this age landed on the kitchen of your grandmother at this age, she wouldn't recognize a single thing. She wouldn't know what a fridge is. She wouldn't know what a washing machine is. Nothing. If your grandmother from here lands on your kitchen here, there's only one thing she won't recognize, which is the microwave. And it's not a big deal. We use it to warm the milk. Okay? Compared to getting a fridge and getting a washing machine, etc., it's not a big deal. So he says, look, antibiotics, washing your hands. There are so many huge things that have been happening that are dramatic, and he says those things are not happening anymore. 
There's one explanation. Maybe this reproductivity is actually slowing down. Maybe it's not such a big deal. We're all wasting our time on the computer. Um, it's un I think it's unlikely because I, I, artificial intelligence is a general purpose technology and it's going to be able, we, it's, we're going to make better use of our conditionings, of all our machines, of our cars. Everything is going to be much better utilized and much more efficiently. That's going to have to produce a big productivity gain. Just think of, um, um, in, in the paper I was telling you that, that they have just revised uh, Cyberson, etc. They have two examples where they just show you the productivity gain from just call centers and self-driving cars. So driving cars, there are millions of people driving cars. It's just the number of people who won't die, the number of jobs that you will liberate if you use the, the artificial intelligence suggest that's going to be huge technological improvement. Call centers, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands uh, of people who are not very productive and who can actually be replaced by machines. So the idea that this is not really happening is kind of, uh, uh, I mean, it's a jump. So then the third idea is, Maybe it's happening, and maybe when we see these firms, which are having really large increase in productivity, the Unitex of the world and the Amazons of the world, we'll actually just see in the future, and all of these firms are not adopting. And then the question is, well, why are they not adopting? Why is productivity slow down in spite of the fact that large productivity gains are possible? And the answer, or one part of the answer, Part of the answer could be complementary investments in things, but a big part of the answer could be uh, complementary investments in the software organization, in the capabilities in what organizations can do. And I've tried to persuade you in this, in this brief lecture that uh, it's quite likely that that's the case, at least in the police force, that's what we found, and, and there is evidence that that happened in manufacturing and in other places. And also, that is extremely hard, and that it's very hard because it requires a lot of things to move in the same direction. So, and the last thing we talked about also very briefly is to what extent these investments, which now require firms that are quite large. I was in the board of a bank, just to give you one last example, and I finished because 45 already. I was in the board of a bank, and it was a mid-sized bank. It was the sixth largest stock, uh, bank uh, uh, by stock market cap in Spain. We had to adopt artificial intelligence. You know, banks very soon are going to know how much money we have spent, how much money we have in the bank, how what bill is going to arrive tomorrow. They're going to know your electricity bill always arrives the first of the month, and that day you're going to need 150. You don't have anything, and the bank is going to show up a little pop-up bill in your phone. It's going to say, "Do you want to borrow 150?" because tomorrow you're not going to have any money. Or you're going to be on holiday, the bank is going to know, the artificial intelligence is going to know you're on holiday, you don't have money for tonight for dinner, it's going to say, hey, you want to go for dinner tonight, here's $200, okay? Artificial intelligence of that kind is going to make the bank massively more productive, obviously. But now think of a very large bank buying the engineers, physicists, mathematicians, getting the codes, the translation that we were talking about to integrate them into the bank making the changes in how they sell and how they organize to make this selling, and now compare it to a bank like the one I was, which was 10 times or 20 times smaller than these other banks, it's clear that for this smaller bank to make all these investments is, is going to be very, very problematic from a human capital perspective, from the um, uh, sound cost perspective, but also from the organizational perspective. Thank you. That's that's it. Thank you. Questions, comments, thoughts on productivity? Yes. Hi. Right, so uh, I want to make a narrow question yeah. about the, the police paper All right. and a broad question about the bias of economists. So okay. in the narrow, uh, how do you see technology changing the production of crime? So you said, well, cops get more efficient, but so do criminals. And the outcomes that you're measuring are kind of where those two things meet. And if you want to use the wire example, you know, you can yeah. imagine now we have cell phones so you can maintain a larger you know, drug dealing network yeah. than you could before. Uh, so that's, that's a narrow question. Uh, but a broader question I have uh, for this distinction between economist pessimism an economist optimism of going forward okay. is that uh, we as economists 
are at the top end of the skill distribution, I hope. Uh, and, uh, Some skills. and so we're going to be naturally more exposed to the benefits of these technologies, and in particular, earlier. And in, we might be extrapolating from our own experiences that these technologies are really helping out everyone as opposed to really the upper skill. You can think about, there are, there are a lot of facts that are consistent with that idea. Uh, you know, the, the skill premium is increasing. The difference between college and non-college wages, the difference between graduate school and college yeah. wages. And, uh, and then you can think about, you know, we have some evidence that people don't realize this at the top skill distribution. For instance, half of all graduating high school seniors in the U.S. are not pursuing any kind of uh, post-high school education, half of them. And if you ask the average economist, I don't think they would know that fact. And so I think we extrapolate a bit. How do you feel that that's informing okay, so, the Okay, so let me start with the second. Uh, let me start with the second. Uh, yes, I, when, when we divided, when we talked about uh, uh, routine and non-routine jobs, uh, I, I divide the world between three types of, of skills by what they can do with, the, with computers. Uh, and I agree with you. Uh, on the low end of the skill distribution, and we had those jobs that were in red, protective services, uh, personal care, uh, security, uh, cleaning services, restaurant services, hospitality services, where essentially the job they're doing today is identical to the one they were doing 30 years ago. If you go into the kitchen of a restaurant there, Medici or something in, in 57th Street, and you go into the kitchen, you see what they're doing. Uh, they're cutting the onions the exact same way. They're frying them in the same way, and they're putting in the salad in the same way. So uh, there is nothing about this thing that seems to us so phenomenal, artificial intelligence and big data and that, that is actually mattering for any of what they do. Uh, then there's a second place, which are the next skill, the middle skill, which, who are doing routine jobs and who actually get replaced by computers very often. And the reason is that computers are... Uh, able to automatize the things that seemed hard originally, but that are actually, that were perfectly well done by people with middle education, but that are actually not very hard in terms of having an algorithm. And then indeed, computers complement people at the very top end of the skill distribution. So I agree that there is a skill bias in the, in the technological change, that it favors the more skill. I also believe, however, that in terms of productivity, uh, the usage of artificial intelligence as a general purpose technology, which is going to be in every situation where there's going to be problem solving, uh, in optimization of every decision from the use of gas to the use of cars to the use of coal, energy, to the use of food, to uh, you're going to be able to retune lots of things. And I think that that's going to be a boost to productivity. But I agree that I could be biased. As to the criminals, you're right. I mean, uh, we, we could be having unobserved changes uh, in criminal technology that, has go, that is escalating and that is making the technology look less good than it is. The technology with the criminals stuck would be fantastic, with the criminals advancing it's not. In terms of finding uh, of the finding of complementarities, as long as that change in the criminals is not kind of uh, correlated with our change, I hope that it's, it's, it's working geographically. I hope it's not, it's not hiding our fact. But you're right that that bias in our data, uh, that strategic behavior by the two sides could be there. So we don't have a disclaimer about that in the paper. So that's a question we didn't get. Uh, more questions and more thoughts on productivity? Yes. How much do you think that regulations on new applications of technology, like potential regulations of self-driving cars, uh, are the first that come to mind might delay the rollout of technologies that might be technologically ready? I, I think that um, it's going to depend on competition uh, between countries. So in some countries, you're going to have, Luigi was telling me yesterday in Rome, the taxi drivers have, have been doing their best to stop Uber, and apparently in a lot of Italy, it, Uber doesn't work. In Barcelona, there's no Uber. In Madrid, there is. Uh, so yes, uh, groups that are going to lose rent, why do you see resistance to change? In every environment, you see resistance to change because in the old technology, the pie was smaller, but I was getting a big pie. In the new technology, the pie is going to grow, but how am I going to ensure that I capture? So I'm going to be kind of obstaculizing until I get bought out or until, uh, or, or as long as possible. Um, 
I think what, what actually makes self-driving car, for example, is a good example. What actually makes this uh, at the global level unlikely to be stopped is that countries compete very hard with each other. So would Europe, if Europe was alone in the world, would somebody pass a rule in Europe saying autonomous cars are not to be allowed? Maybe. Maybe they would be tempted. But if you have Korea experimenting and you have California experimenting, you have the experiments in Utah and Arizona and all over the U.S., if you don't do it, then all the industry is going to move there. So the industry in Europe is going to want this experimentation. So my sense is that the competition from China and from Asia and the competition between the blocks is going to push this much faster rather on the opposite direction than we would have expected. For example, military applications. Military applications seem insane, right? You're going to have machines making life and death decisions. Uh, you would say, well, that's not going to happen because humans won't allow it. Well, you know, you're in a war and you have a machine that is going to save you lots of soldiers, going to kill the other soldiers better. Of course you're going to use it. That's happened every time. And maybe in normal times, maybe in a unipolar world you could control that, but with the Cold War starting between China and the U.S., is the U.S. going to not want to be the leading in AI-enabled soldiers? Yeah, it will want, and China as well. So this is going to develop extremely fast. So I, I, would, I would say, if anything, um, I'm not only not worried, but I actually think, if anything, technology will be accelerated by this international competition. Hi. Uh, I was wondering if you compare these graphs of the divergence of frontier firms with respect to laggard firms. Uh, of course, we don't have the data, but, but looking anecdotally at other general purpose technologies changes, do you think it's something special of what's going on right now or something that it's, it's common to other general purpose technologies mm, and the way the technology I think is? it's common to general purpose technologies that very small spread at the start and then a big jump. So I think that, that that happens. But I don't know if it's common and I haven't seen anybody look it up and I don't think they can really look it up because the data wouldn't allow them to do it. It's like, for example, when electricity open cars expanded, if you would have that. But it's easy to guess that that would be the case, that you would have lots of car firms and there would be some guys using some technology, some guys using others, and that eventually, you know, with every technology comes in, you get the phase of fast, rapid entry. Then you get checkout. If you see the EMI CAT scanner, you start with five or six, with EMI alone. Then you have six firms. The next year, you have 14. Two years after, then you have a checkout, and then you have five GE, Siemens, etc. the other ones to get out. So I would imagine that in any technology, you're going to have everybody adopting, everybody going in, a big heterogeneity, and then the shakeout. But I haven't seen data for the previous three waves of big innovation. This is the fourth industrial revolution, and we've seen three waves as large as this. And I, don't, I would imagine, but I, I haven't seen the data. Can I follow up on this with a bit of skepticism? Yeah. Let's imagine that business services is actually teaching in business schools. Okay? So productivity doesn't increase, but if you take the frontier firms, are probably better pricing power than the non-frontier firms, and they increase a gap. So if you look at business school and you measure sort of revenue productivity, but that's what you measure, you're going to see the same increase. So to what extent this phenomenon is not just divergent? a markup? Exactly. So, I mean, this is, as, as I, we, we discussed the first day, and I don't have a great answer for that. I mean, the entire profession, this, this, the two or three papers that have, uh, that have, uh, influence the world on this have been uh, produced over the last uh, year. Just, just went. I was going to ask James to help me out. James is a super expert on this, on this uh, topic. And the two or three papers that have made these points about markups have been from the last two years. We are all trying to discuss exactly markups are climbing or not climbing. So it's possible that Luigi's explanation is the one that is behind here. And if you look at business services, uh, it's, 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 it's plausible. I, I am not going to deny it. I mean, I do think that it's most likely that um, what you see in terms of vertical disintegration, vertical integration in this, in this area is that, oh, there you are. I was just mentioning your work. So do you hear Luigi's question? I didn't hear it. Okay, so Luigi said, I'm skeptical about this graph. Could it just be that productivity is actually not increasing? And business services is maybe teaching in business school or, you know, being a consultant and you still take one hour to build one hour of consulting time 
So productivity hasn't increased, but it's just um, top firms markup. No, but, but tell, tell, tell the guys what, what's your sense of, of, of whether, I mean, don't try to make it as untechnical as, as possible. Uh, so one way you can think about markups is, uh, which are, you know, prices over cost, uh, marginal costs, uh, is not thinking about management as an input. And if you do that, then for top firms, which might, you know, have a lot of managerial capital, it's going to look like the costs are really low. So it's going to look like the markup, the price over those costs, are really high. Uh, but turns out, at least my own work, uh, if you put that back in, you don't really have that effect anymore. So if you try to account for the fact that they are spending resources on developing out these managerial systems, you don't get that result. So if you think of it as just you know mana from heaven, you now have managerial ability. Maybe it looks like you're you know, charging more than you should be, whatever you want to say. Uh, but if you try to think about that as really an investment that the firm had to make, uh, that goes away. The markup effect goes away, and then it would, tr it would be truly productivity. So uh, James is involved in a, I would say, uh, maybe I can call it a fight between us, in a dispute with some of the guys who've, who've found the markup. He's pretty persuasively argued that the markup story is not there. But uh, it's going to take a long time before this is settled. Um, and a lot of papers. But uh, if, if we agree that it's most likely productivity, I mean, I think it fits nicely with the whole, uh, with the whole idea that this diffusion is taking longer and that uh, the complementary, complementary investments, particularly the soft investments and organizational investments, are hard to make. I might take one more, but we are just one, one more minute. There's one more. Yeah. Hi. Um, my question's around... Uh, in the previous industrial revolutions when new technology was introduced, uh, there had to be complementary changes that you said for them to actually take effect to see the productivity gains. Yeah. And that includes soft changes, like organizational changes, and hard changes. Correct. Um, how did those happen? How did the soft changes happen then? Is it just a function of time? Like... Yeah, or was it, or, and those hard and soft changes, were they conscious, were they subconscious, is it just a function of time? Or okay, so I, I, think, I think you have, you have always uh, a huge effect is Schumpeterian. So Schumpeterian competition is like, you know, some guys die, and nobody really knows what they're doing, but the better guys survive and all the other ones get, get washed out. But we also have evidence of, 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 of very smart soft changes. The, the best evidence of that is Alfred Sloan's my years at General Motors biography. He was, Sloan was the, the first modern CEO. Uh, he came from the DuPont School. He had studied in DuPont. The DuPont School, I mean the DuPont Corporation, which was his school. DuPont was the, one of the first companies which understood how uh, the new technologies allowed for big scale and for multi-plant operations. And Sloan came in and invented soft invented the multidivisional corporation. So he basically got the economies of scale where he could, but essentially had seven units within General Motors, Chevrolet, Buick, etc., divided vertically in, 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 the, in, the, um, in, in the price range that they could cover, and he would have committees that would be doing joint purchasing, etc. So <clears throat> he radically changed management, and many, many people uh, uh, went after him, basically from the initial Ford, which also is a big soft change, right? Ford is actually inventing standardized production and all the complementarities that come in the original system. But uh, he invented a possibility, Sloan invented the possibility to actually produce in a way that you're adapting more to the environment, devolving power to those managers of the brands while extracting some of the synergies. So I think... Uh, that's that's the big. I mean, his biographies from the his his big moments are, are in the twenties, uh, and the moment that G GM really kind of exploded, uh, and uh, Ford is from the tens, and I think those are the big managers of that moment. So there is a lot of unconscious stuff going on. There is a lot of experimentation. People don't know, don't have a clue. They start, and some people survive, some people die, and that's why I show these graphs that really show you that. I mean, one of the key forces in economics 
if not the key force, right, is death, right? It's like all these guys shouldn't be there. They are getting resources and extracting from that resource 100, 125, 6, uh, 6, whatever, I don't know how to say, 1 to 156 of what these other firms are extracting. Uh, if they were not there and those resources went here, you would just have a much more productive uh, country. So in a world like the U.S., which is very dynamic, where competition actually does its work, a lot of that change is going to happen by, you know, I mean, yeah, by, by, by death and, and the survival of new firms. And if you look at, at police, if you look what happens in Chicago, and you look at what happens in, 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 in New York, the problem for that is that in the police you have unions, it's public sector, and you don't have, I mean, in normal circumstances, the New York Police Department would have taken over the Chicago one. They would have merged. They would be, Bratton would be the boss of all these forces, right? But you can be pretty terrible and continue being the boss and have, uh, be protected by, in the public sector and be protected by, nobody's going to say like, okay, you go bankrupt and we close you, right? Be protected by the fact that it's public sector. So um, in the public sector, you always have much more of this heterogeneity and it's much harder to get this kind of change. And that's why uh, Robert Gernon the other day was, was making this point to me that I, I think it's, it's very true that um, both at non-profits, foundations, social sector, found all of these, all of these elements, uh, because this discipline doesn't exist, change is so much harder. Thank you, guys. It was fun to have you for three days. I appreciate it.